How are you? And welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 830, with my guest today, Dean Franco. I'm Jeremy Lesnick. I love martial arts. I love traditional martial arts. I love all of you traditional martial artists. And that's why we make so many things to support the traditional martial artists of the world. And if you start your I don't know, hunt at whistlekick.com, you'll find a bunch of things, probably things that will extend your enjoyment of martial arts, whether it's a training program for making your knees a little more bulletproof, increasing your flexibility, that one's free, uh, or maybe some apparel or protective equipment. Lots and lots of options over there. So go check it out. Go go see what's going on. We got stuff for individuals. We got stuff for school owners. We got training programs for martial arts of teachers. Like there's, there's just a ton of great stuff. Use the code PODCAST15, saves you 15% on just about everything that we do. Now, my guest today, Mr. Dean Franco. You may know him from his podcast. We talk about that. You may know him from seminars, from some of the people he hangs out with. We've had a bunch of them on the show. But what you may not know is how great a guy he is. If you've been around him, you know that. But I had such a wonderful conversation, and I hope you can tell that I'm being very genuine here. I enjoy all of my episodes. I enjoy talking with all these people. I like talking to people, but I don't have as genuinely a fun time as I did with Dean. Such a great time. And I hope that comes through. So uh, this kind of felt like two old friends who really hadn't talked before sitting down and, and chatting and maybe some of this that, that he has a podcast so he's quite practiced and being on the other side of the camera and the mic i had fun so you'll have fun and i'll see you on the other side see you in the outro well hey i i want to extend my uh humility and humble and honored you know for you to have me on thank you no i'm, I'm glad to have you on i've been paying attention to what you guys are doing you're doing good stuff and I'm trying to you know no you are you are <laughs> just, um you know, one of the things I said when, when we got this going was I never wanted it to just be us, right? I, I ground out this platform and now we have ground out this platform because nothing else existed. You know, whistle, when Whistlekick launched, it wasn't a podcast in mind. It was, let's sell some products. And I couldn't yeah, figure out how to sell the products. So we made a podcast. Yeah. And you now, guys reach out to i mean the full gamut you know what i mean yeah yeah we try to get all over the place i mean you're you're four of four today uh taekwondo karate tai chi and uh, i'm trying to remember what else i recorded today i don't even remember well you did once four, they're done so, I some, so you yeah. do four a day you're the fourth one i'm recording today yeah we don't record every day but yeah, because wow. we we're, we do two a week. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Keep on, you guys. Four a day. I'd be like, oh. <laughs> I, th I think you're. Oh, it's it's taken years to get to the point where I can do this. Yeah. And, and there are certain things that I do, like I I haven't eaten. I'm about four, maybe four hundred calories in, but it's all fat, right? Like there are a bunch of little things that I've figured out over the years that help me. Help me get here. Yeah, they get through four uh, four episodes. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're going to be episode eight thirty, something like that. Eight thirty. All right, I am marking. We'll, it we'll we'll let you know when we commit to that. Once sometimes we arrange okay. things, but just to give you an idea of like where we're at, like this is. No, that's pretty incredible. I mean, we've been so, cranking. So, what do you do? So after that, you put it on there for folks to watch it at aftermath. Yeah. Yeah, it's just okay. we, we, whatever we get, we, we put it out there. You know, we don't do a lot of editing. You know, it's, uh, you know, if somebody coughs or, you know, they have to go deal with the dog or something, you know, we'll, we'll edit that. But yeah. usually just kind of kind of let it run. Yeah, no, no, no. So, sounds easy. <laughs> yeah. You want to you dive in? I'm ready if you're ready. We can, we can just dive in. Let's dive in. Um, All right. You know, I don't... <sighs> I don't know that we've had an in-person conversation. You know, we've been in the same place, but I don't know that we've ever chatted. No, we met not the year before April when my first um, at uh, Terry Dow's thing. That was, we met, um, yeah. but no, we didn't get a chance to okay. uh, like, talk. That, I'm, I'm glad my memory is serving me. It doesn't always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've been looking forward to this, getting to know you. 
a, yeah. a bit better. Um, you know, your your if not training, your interest at least is all in FMA, Filipino martial arts. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I would say that's definitely my major now. Um, so previous to Ooh, that, I, I like I like that because I like academic metaphors. They seem to work. Yeah, so yeah, major. Yeah. That's I, that's brilliant. Yeah. So I started out Taekwondo um, and then, which I was enjoying and I saw the first UFC 93 and I just, I wanted it. I just, I want to experience what I was seeing on, um, you know, in, in, in the fights there. So in Connecticut, I was very fortunate. Uh, his name is Ron Kazakowski. And at the time he was, he was offering BJJ, uh, Jeet Kune Do, and Thai boxing and everything like that. In so the I early 90s? This, no. So I saw it and I didn't get wind of him until okay. like 96. So but even there was still, a, that's, er, that's early. No, he was a pine. Yeah. He, Folks uh, outside of New in, England don't understand that we no. often lag behind. Correct. Correct. And so he absolutely a pioneer as far as Connecticut is concerned. Mm. Ron Kowalski. Awesome. 100%. Yeah. And uh, so I went down there. So what's ironic is I went down there looking at the lens. I don't even know if it was called MMA back then, uh, but just this a little here, a little there and there, you know, whatever they were calling it back then. Sure. Um, but what I really found uh, was my true love was basically he offered Filipino martial arts as well. Mm. So when I saw that, um, I still did the JKD. And the other stuff, but I really, I kind of dove into FMA and um, kind of has been my major ever since. And with specifics to edge weapons. Mm. Now, my my background as I got in, as I found FMA, which I've, I've not gone nearly as deep into as, as you have, of course, and I fully acknowledge that. But I'm, I'm wondering if if the light bulb you had if, if we can call mm. it that the the, the <gasps> you moment yeah. you had when you saw it was similar to mine would, would you mind talking about what it was like getting to experience yeah. that for the first time yeah so what happened was um i was doing a makeup class and uh that makeup class happened to be which kind of fit my schedule was um his filipino martial arts class mm. so i didn't know what to expect i mean um i knew he had that class but i couldn't tell you anything more than it's on the schedule you know, so I go there and he was doing it just happened that day. He was doing basically sticky hand knife. You mm. know, you're coming at you. You're kind of monitoring, trying to keep cohesion on there. Done. Sold. Mm. I, mean, I just the way the beauty of it flowed and all that and the different movements and how you had to be center center mass and vital targets aware and how you had to move in concert. And I mean. I was just so mm. yeah. How, how much Taekwondo training had you had prior? I got to second degree. Uh, okay, so, don't ask so me more to do than a little. Kicks. No, yeah, don't ask me to do any kicks. But, but I, do I, any I think the context kicks. is relevant, right? You know, yeah. Um, so I, I'm guessing, and, and I'll, I'll articulate my experience. When I saw brush grab strike, I went, oh, mm. this is everywhere. It felt like the missing yeah. piece. It felt like that puzzle piece that had fallen under the table that you didn't. Yeah. Wait, wait. Oh, and now you can see the picture. It, it made yeah. so much sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely was a light bulb moment. Also, you know, the light bulb moment was also at the range. You know what hmm. I mean? Like there was long, there was medium, and then there was close. So uh, Largo, Medio, Corto. And, you know, it just, it all, again, it just, um, it was like I found what I was looking for without knowing what I was looking for. Mm. <laughs> you know, is the best way I could put it. And it's not that I abandoned JKD. Matter of fact, I, I got to associates level in JKD. I mostly use the JKD, definitely some of the five ways attacks, but more of the open philosophy of like, okay, I'm not going to be, you know, I'm going to take here, integrate it there and um if i don't find it's useful or my students it's not useful for them then i'm going to remove it so i definitely still adopt that jkd philosophy use what's useful discard what's not uh but definitely heavily into the fma lane yeah. mm. okay and so where 
you know, because I'm doing a little bit of math. You're, you're fairly young when you find this stuff. Yeah, so you know, definitely earlier. I, I would say earlier than than anybody I know personally. Yeah, like again, I mean, Connecticut, you know, as far as back then, I mean, again, we're talking 96. So when you think of FMA back in 96 in Connecticut, um, we're not talking California, New York, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, New Jersey. Um, so, yeah, so I was thir- I, 30, 30 years old, had the Taekwondo behind me, so um, which helped with the JKD, my kicking. Um, so that, that worked out nicely. And then when I got the FMA, there is an empty hand aspect, of course, sure. uh, in FMA. And, um, yeah, so we got 30 and still going. Yeah. Mm, that's awesome. So, yeah. so here's a question. I, I, I like, I like the journey aspect, you know, yeah. most of the folks that we've had on the show have, even if they, they stuck with their original art they end up cross-training, right? Just inevitably that tends to happen. What do you think would have been different about your experience with JKD and FMA and these other things you're learning if you hadn't had that Taekwondo background? I don't know if I would have seen it because while I was doing a Taekwondo and I, again, referencing, you know, 93 to first uh, UFC, I was really looking then um, you know, of course I had a loyalty to Taekwondo. I never dismissed it and said, you know, sure. I mean, it was, it was my stepping stone and I still get the absolute one of respect for that. But yeah, I don't know, you know, I don't think I would have found it as quickly as I have. And if I think of some years went past, who knows what would happen? Maybe I would have became disinterested. Mm-hmm. Maybe other events in my life would have taken over and thus I wouldn't pursued. So I'm very fortunate for Taekwondo that it did segue into these other arts. Okay. So talk about the, those those early years. You know, you come in, you're taking some classes, yeah, you're digging it. But of course, you 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 took it and ran with it. You know, I, I yeah. Spoiler alert! Alert. You know, you're you're not just yeah. a casual practitioner. Mm. But when when does that tide start to turn? Okay. So 96, when I was doing FMA, I met my JKD instructor, Chris Smith, who was also a student of Ron's, but was going on his own. So while I was training with Ron at FMA, I was seeking Chris out for JKD. Um, When I was with Chris, I had, um, he just gave me a lot of freedom. I, I really attribute him to so many things by giving me, uh, if it wasn't for him, I, I don't think I'd be right, sitting right here and talking to you mm. and, or have FMA discussion or create my own system. He actually instilled in me, create your own journey, your own version of you take the, and I took the ball and ran with it. And where it started was I had a ACL uh, repair so I was just sick of sitting home on a couch. And so I would go to this school. I couldn't be in there doing JKD kickboxing because I was a liability. My mobility was, was compromised. So I'd go on the wall. I'm saying, hey, can you guys mind just coming out of a knife? I just figured I'm going to do something. And light bulbs started going off. And it, this is actually the very beginning of how I started my system. It just mm. wasn't the system back then. Um, and I came to this revelation of two on one because I couldn't move. I couldn't mm. like size, but like I had, to, you know, I had to rely on this gross motor, you know, there. Right. That's when from that point on, I could say literally took the ball and just mm. have it start running. Okay. And, and what did that development process look like? So it was very rudimentary, very rough looking. uh, But as my mobility came back, I went from static against a wall to now moving and it grew, it grew. And then I didn't, you know, so no social media. I mean, we're talking very early internet. Who the heck is Dean Franco? I mean, so it's not like, I, I, guys, I have this stuff, but I knew it was something special. And I'm going to get into this later where I, how I know it how I knew it then and how it became. Um, but I had no way of like advertising it or, or 
are releasing it or showing it to the masses. I mean, again, being in Connecticut. So I, did, I just continued to develop it around my training partners and students. Um, it was very defensive initially. Uh, so what is Blade Tech today is now comprehensive. Back then was very def defensive oriented. Um, and so Carl Atienza, Atienza brothers, I was training with them. We're now into early 2000s. Um, so he he recognized I was really good at knife. He goes, hey, and, and I was an Atienza rep back then. He goes, hey, you know, you should call your faction. He came up with this name. I'm, he goes, Blade Technologies. I'm like, okay. So it's kind of stuck ever since then um, in there. So that's um, A, how the beginning of me taking the ball and run with it. B, also the kind of beginning of my system. Okay. All right. Now, you, you mentioned early internet, pre-social media. Yeah. You know, that was kind of the, there was a short span in there where I think it was the heyday of, like DVD lessons, because finally Black there Panther. was a way to find out about them, right? You didn't just yeah. have to, you didn't just find them in the magazines. And Correct. so there was maybe it was a five year span or so where DVDs yeah. were flying all over the place. Were, were you in on that? Were you? Oh yeah, I definitely got some. Oh yeah, 100% because, you know, Black Belt Magazine was kind mm -hmm. of the source inside Kung Fu and you look in the back and who's selling what or advertising. Yeah, at 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Those were definitely referenced. And, you know, I was going to some seminars, like for instance, I mentioned the Atienzas. Um, so at this point, I'm still with Chris Mm -hmm. But I'm really branching out into different systems. So the first, the system I got my first certification in FMA was through Chris Smith, which is the Anasano blend. So I got my mm -hmm. Anasano blend. So what you do is, generally speaking, when you graduate JKD, you also you get the FMA co part of it. So I got there. So then I went to go train with Sayox and Atanzas, and this is circa early 2000s, mm -hmm. and started my own school so there's there was a lot going mm. on back then yeah mm. when i look back it's kind of surreal you know you know it's it's interesting talking about just just the way you mentioned it you know training in jkd but i was kind of going off and doing my own thing yeah <laughs> and and what what i what i just kind of want to underscore is that that sentence doesn't happen in that way if a jkd yeah. was something else you know, you don't generally say, I was doing tight karate with this person, but I was kind of going off on yeah. my own, right? Not That's that a, it can't yeah. happen, not that it doesn't happen, but especially then it rarely happened. And if it did, I'm, I'm going to guess that your JKD instructor was like, yeah, go for it. I support yeah. you. Whereas even when it does happen today, for the most part, it's at best neutral. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you just touched upon something very important. And that is that open door mentality. And the reason being is if you look at Bruce Lee, look at everybody you trained with. Now you look at Dan Asano, look at everybody you trained with. So everybody that's kind of under there, it's accepted that you're going to go train with other people and you're going to take and pull and basically under a JKD lens, if you will, put it into your JKD, whatever it may be, it's Sabat, or you took, you want deeper into Muta, you want deeper into FMA, whatever, and the conceptual in a JKD. And so you're absolutely right. Like, it's not unusual when you hear this guy or anybody for that matter, circa late 90s or 2000s, they were bouncing around. They probably were in some shape, way, or form were affiliated with JKD. So you're absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah. Which, which I just, I find really cool. You know, my, my, original roots are in karate. I was very blessed with the instructors I yeah. had. They were very open. And it wasn't until I started training in other schools that I realized that that wasn't always how it was. Yeah, I've heard but some FMA, horror stories. But FMA seems to be, even today, much more open. People seem to be more, Yeah, you do what you do. I'm doing what I do, but I really want to see what you do. Let's, let's experiment. Yeah. It's true, but it, you'd never, you, it wasn't always like that. No. So, okay. for instance, there, like if you look at the haven of FMA, Stockton, California, I mean, back then there were some like you either, you know, not all of it, of course, but there was definitely some tribal, you know what I mean? 
Now I'm definitely seeing now, for instance, and I can attest this because I've actually see it just unfold in front of me. So when COVID kicked in, I'm doing podcast and all this, and I'm seeing folks resorting to zoom to teach their lessons. Mm -hmm. Well, the byproduct of that was, Hey, why don't we do a seminar together? Hey, you bring your students, I'll bring mine. Now you're seeing this cross pollination mm -hmm. of different systems. And in lieu of that, now I'm seeing that continue. I think it's a wonderful, great thing. And I'm glad it's happened. But pre COVID, it wasn't happening online. And geographically speaking, the states, nowhere's as much as now. So I think COVID had a huge piece. To deal well, remember with pre-COVID, you can't learn martial arts online. <laughs> no, you, right? right? <laughs> well, you can't learn martial arts online. I'm never going to teach martial arts online. Yeah, oh, guess wait, what? my school is collapsing and I have zero dollars. Uh, so and my landlord's coming arts around. Online. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Funny how that yeah. Uh, it's so funny. Like you would see these diehard guys. And I've seen an FA community. And before you know it, like, because I've had from a discussion, I let everybody post there because I want everybody to yeah. get opportunity and all that. And I go, wow, he's teaching online. <laughs> I mean, it's just like people that you wouldn't suspect by much to your point when the bills start coming in, change That's of right. tune. That's right. That's right. <laughs> all right. So as you as you dig into Blade Tech, you you, you mentioned that you I don't know if knew or suspected there, there was, there was some uh, instinct that you were mm. onto something that you said, yeah. as time went on, you were able to kind of concretely define. And I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, I, I opened up my, yeah, I opened up my school in 2002, 2003. And so during that time, I'm still, you know, refining this and creating and that, and it, you know, it took off from sewing machine to over the attack and to random slashes. Um, again, definitely heavily on the defensive side. And uh, so come, I sold my school 2012 or 13, because I wanted to become a student again. And because uh, I was just so wrapped up in the school teaching and just it just I just couldn't be a student I really and I really missed that um so I go to go be a student again so 2014 I see Burton Richardson and a picture sewing machine doing this I'm like you gotta be kidding me I'm like that's what I do mm. so that just substantiated and just immediately gave just credence to all these years I was doing when I first started, like was 1998. Mm. I just didn't have the name of Burton Richardson <laughs> or the notoriety of, uh, you know, of Burton, who's, who's actually my teacher now. So it's been, a he's great. He's been, he's been on the show there was a fun, yes. moment. pardon me. I hear oh. extreme wind and I'm just double checking that my house is not okay. falling apart on the camera. <laughs> But we, uh, he came on the show yeah. and I, it was driving me nuts. I, I knew, I knew of him and I couldn't place it. And there was a moment. And if you go back and, and why, I think if you watch or listen to the episode, I think it comes up in the episode where it was just like a ton of bricks. It was a black belt cover. cover. I was like, I remember, yeah. I remember the cover. I remember what he was wearing. Oh, uh, somehow defense, defense instructor of the year. That, that one. I, I think so. I think he's wearing like a red shirt. I think it's like red yeah, and yellow. I, I, I'm pretty confident it was uh, defense. Yeah, and it, it just it tripped me out that yeah. you know because it was oh, quite a while ago. That yeah, he did that cover and I was like, wow, and it stuck with me. Yeah, he's I, I can't say enough uh, things about him. Um, yeah, I mean he's just a gem in so many respects. Mm -hmm. But so I see this picture and he's coming to New York and I'm seeing this uh, this flyer. I'm like, I gotta go see this guy. I, I like, I need to know how he came up with this. What was his findings? How did he right. get there? So I go to New York. This is 2014 or 15, and I meet him. And I said, I can't believe you're doing this. And and there was a subtle difference between what we did, but so close, so close. And um, been his student ever since. And it really just validated everything I was doing. Mm. 
up at that point because I'm not, have you, have you heard the term tapping an FMA knife tapping where you're paring no. down? No, I, I, okay. I, I think I know okay. what you're talking about, but maybe not with that. Term. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, tapping is a very, um, it's one of the defensive movements a lot of FMA systems use. And basically what you're doing, the knife is coming here. I imagine the knife guy's arm. You just I'm happen to have it. Down. That's how you know you're an FMA practitioner. You just happen to have oh. a training blade on your desk. <laughs> Incidentally. Yeah. So you parry it down like that. Mm -hmm. And um, and so most of the community do that. So I was kind of an outsider. Like I'm just going gross motor movement, biological response, boom. Right. Yep. And it was so wonderful that somebody else like validated, not just somebody else, but somebody else on mm. hierarchy far as, you know, notable, sure. you know what I mean, figure in FMA. So it just validated. It was just so gratifying because it just validated all this work that just wasn't doing something aimless. You know what mm. I mean? And uh, yeah. So it was wonderful. Cool. Okay. Mm. Um, how has your system changed okay so again it went from primary defensive system and this actually happened at last six months so pete mm -hmm. so so through my journey and all that becoming a student again um i had anson blend say akatienza preschool at, now going through school post school after selling it i get began fully wanted to be student role. And so I got certified in a Burton, Abenir Kalis. I just went full heart into being a student. Um, looked at Piper Knife, African System, became instructor in that, um, and uh, Kali Ilishisimo in there. And so what my students were seeing is, so I had all these different systems and, and they, they just saw like, what I was doing offensively in conjunction with the defense. So they go, why? And so this mm, two years ago, three, like, how come you're not coming on your own system? How come you're not coming on your own system? Well, you know, I'm still being a student and I, I just want to really make sure and kind of formulate this stuff. I was getting the defensive stuff. And finally, six months ago, I'm like, you know what? If I don't do it now, it's just never going to happen. So I finally compiled an all, all offensive levels in conjunction with defensive levels, how hence now it's a comprehensive system. Mm. However, it's heavily stressed. So you have the offense and defense, but the pre-violent stage, I direct a lot of attention there and mock drills. In other words, how did the person outside of ambush, somebody jumping out of a tree, how did a person get there? So I go through a lot of mock stuff, not to let the person get there for safe distance. Distance mm -hmm. giving you time, time giving you options. Less distance, less time, less options. So there's a precursor before they even go into training defensive or anything like that. So there's a lot of stress and material in the pre-violence. So they get the pre-violence, the actual defenses, and then the offense. Okay. And... How about for the folks that haven't done an AFMA? You know, probably have a lot of folks who come in with a, you know, a Taekwondo yeah. background or karate background, and then they're probably yeah. hanging with us and they're going, okay, I can see some of this stuff conceptually, but maybe you could talk about some of the differences, not just in FMA in general, but, mm. you know, what you found and you said, you know, I, I need to do more of this and less of that really. Cause that's, mm. you know, there are only so many ways to move. And I imagine that the majority of the things you were doing where, you, you know, your system is more of and less of as compared to others. Correct. So I'm heavily in the attribute development lane, okay. meaning like I have nothing against drills and I do have some drills, but within those drills, there's an aspect of attribute development. Mm. And so I use drills, I call them platforms. So for, for example, um, me and you are standing across from one another, okay, for starters. And I can touch your hand, but I can't get to your center. Mm -hmm. While I'm trying to go for your hand, you're gonna move, you're gonna move your hand or slightly move your body. And then you're gonna look for first counter. So I'm trying to instill in the student these attribute developments while hand evasion, for instance, but also looking 
for the counter, depending on what's going on and all that. However, in conjunction with that, there's a high dose of like, what's your moral compass, mm. value system, legally mm. defensible. So I really stress my folks, look, you're using this because there's multiple people, somebody broke into the threshold of your house, but obviously in Lowe's parking lot, somebody calling your name, no. Sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I mean, that's thoroughly covered. So I don't use the word drills, I call it, you know, platform drills, you know, and again, heavily on the attribute development. So what do I, so what are some of those attributes? Speed, non-telegraphic, accuracy, power, position, stuff of that nature that I'm trying to cultivate in a student. Mm -hmm. And so regardless of what their background is, it's still for them easy to be accessible to them because there's there's levels, incremental levels of development. So in other words, if a new student came in, he's gonna move around with somebody, but it's gonna be at the it's gonna be at a very beginning level. And the advanced student may be working on his material, but not so far where it's gonna make it impossible or difficult for the new student. So mm-hmm. both are gonna get something out of the exchange in there. Uh, it sounds very intellectual. It sounds like you sat down with a lot of pen and paper as you were putting this together. Everybody said it's funny you brought that up because I don't think I mean I don't think of I'm mean, anything special. I just I could I just a hard worker. But everybody said it because like because they were I was showing somebody kind of like the outline. A couple mm. of my students actually actually um, you know because I have three levels: level one, level two, without getting carried away. Ten ten levels. I mean just you know <laughs> and where you start to lose what really happens out there. So level one and two and, and they're looking at it. And they're looking at the systems that are incorporated. They're looking at the very detail in the levels, offense, defense, the pre on stage, the mission statement. And they're like, and they're just like, wow, how long did it take you to do this? I go, well, it's been up here for a couple of decades. It just finally took from here and put it on paper, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so to answer your question, the short or long. Uh, yeah, a lot of time up here and Finally, the time and the confidence to put it on paper. Okay. Why do you still train? I want to, um, great question. Um, multitude of reasons. One, I want to be a role model for my students. I want to be in the trenches in there with them. This is not just me on the sidelines telling them, okay, you know, they're like, I'm in there with them. I'm, mm. exi- I'm experiencing failures with them. And there and all that, you know, I'm, I'm part of them. Um, one, to be relevant. I don't want to ever be stagnant. Um, I feel if you're a teacher and you have students and you're not still being a student, I think there could be a death, a death within the group there because mm. you're not going out and bettering yourself or in there to me, always a student, you know, I tell, and I tell my students, maybe I cross a few more bridges than you, but at the end of the day, we're all in this together and we're working. And, um, and it's something they really appreciate because um, I don't put myself on a hierarchy here. I'm, you know, like, literally I'm in the trenches with them, you know, Let's talk about weapons. Let's talk about the influence that Filipino martial arts has had on the weapons conversation, right? Because prior, right, prior to most people's experience with Filipino martial arts, weapons generally meant Okinawan weapons, right? We're talking Mm. bow, we're talking nunchaku, we're talking eku, the or, we're talking sai and kama. And they're interesting, but with the possible exception of a bow, kind of impractical. You know, people aren't generally, I know people who have, and they've successfully deployed nunchaku that they had carried as a self-defense tool, but you're probably not walking down the street with a pair of sai. Yeah. You're probably not walking down the street with a pair of kama, but uh, knives, I mean, knives are everywhere, right? Like there's a knife on my desk. You know, that's not yeah. a training blade. They're all over the place. And I feel like we suddenly ended up with a more contemporary perspective on weapons and how they interfaced with this stuff that we've been doing for a long time. Yeah. 
I think it goes back, if you look at the Philippines, a country that was constantly being invaded. Um, I mean, so you're going back to, you know, the Moros from the bottom coming up and trying to invade, you know, the Midland. Then obviously you had the Spanish, the Americans, and then the Japanese. So, and natural, I'm sure, infighting. Mm. So, yeah. Um, so I think what it was is, during all these wars and invasions, I mean that it's a system that was based, you know, obviously on weapons and that and then and I think the practicality came because you know it was they couldn't in other words, you know, they would do like an abridged system, Cinco Tarot, for instance. So Cinco Taro is basically one, two, three, four, and thrust, right? So I mentioned that is because they had to get people ready to fight okay and there so there wasn't so the art no i mean so in other words it was tactics it wasn't really the art like you're seeing today you know what i mean and nothing that's nothing wrong with that no, no. you know what i mean evolution like anything else yeah it sounds similar but, to the the early day philosophy of krav maga like we yeah. got to distill this down we got to teach people this stuff in days weeks yeah, months, right. months I mean, and years Exactly. So in other, in other words, like, and this is kind of documented, and I'm talking to a few folks via FMA discussion and interviews. So let's look at the sign region, the middle region of the Philippines. So you have the Moros coming up and trying to like, you know, basically invade. Yeah. And so the Spanish friars at time were, were giving, you know, the Filipinos at that point, some basic stuff. But again, it was based on, you know, swords and all that, um, you know, edge weapons being on attack. So I think it's really heavily due just to you just defend, defending their homeland, defending mm -hmm. their country, a, 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 this constant evasion of people coming in. Now, there's definitely influence from in China, Indonesia, mm -hmm. all kind of Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely kind of in there especially when you look at Luzon the upper area and Visayan region in the middle Mindanao heavily Muslim your Silat Kuntao mm. kind of there so to me when we look at the weapon stay the knife and the use of the blunt weapon or palm stick it's because look practicality you know what I mean so maybe you're not carrying a stick but maybe it's a collapsible baton you know what I mean and so, yeah, so I think people, it resonates with people because they could see the practicality of carrying use and all that. Um, I mean, I love the bow staff, fascinating with it. I, you know, it's something I just started like really trying to get better at, mm. you know, but we know walking around the bow staff, <laughs> it might, you know, it might not be the much, you know, you might get away with a cane or a, yeah, you know, a right. rocking stick of some fashion. Yeah. You know? People are going to call you Gandalf, but you know, at least you can yeah, do it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think it's, practicality um knife obviously or, or palm stick or something like that accessibility you can carry it you know blood weapon translation okay i got well okay stick seeks bone all right rolling pin frying pan you, you know what i mean that translation into yeah. seeking bone so i think you know that would sum it up um if you the further expand on on the answer but kind of digress not, i don't want to say digressing but kind of switching gears into let's look at prison knife systems mm. so let's look at piper south african system let's look at medusa american knife prison system you want to talk about relevance now these are attacks that are going on as we speak you know what i mean whether it's in south africa whether it's in a, any penal institution and then Latin America. So those are two systems I've become certified in because I want to give my students, I want to be relevant. Yeah. You know, if something new comes out, I want to be able to give them the best version of myself so they could be the best version of themselves. So I try to ma re maintain relevance and what's coming out. So alluding to the systems I just mentioned, Piper and Medusa. Yeah, I, I'm so, unfamiliar with, with those. I, I, don't, I don't even think I've heard of them. Yeah, I a little more. Yeah. Okay. So Piper is basically a South African system. So Piper is a melting pot of sea lot, Queensberry boxing, some African stick and Zulu stick and shield, spear and shield. Mm, okay. So, 
so the moment is very, very different, very, very different. Um, and that it's a very heavily tactic based system and the offense is sort of the defense. Now there's a criminal, unfortunately, a criminal element to it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? However, I'm fascinated with methodology. Like, and I look at it as not, Hey guys, I'm going to give you this and obviously not embracing the criminal mentality, but extracting like, for instance, in my level three in Blade Tech, it's up and close. So, hey, guys, this is why we don't want people up and close because Piper relies on these pieces of resistance, reverse attack, heavily thrusting. And now they're on top of you, collapsing into you, and boom. They have movements like what they call the major twirl there, where now you don't know what's coming, and there, a lot of distractions and stuff like that. Very different, very unique. I find it fascinating, even though... I don't embrace the criminal mentality. I look at it from a tactic point of view, a methodology to, again, further my understanding against empty hand against knife. God forbid if I were to see that and be, you know, and be in mm -hmm. front of that and for my students. That's kind of Piper overall. Medusa is basically an American prison system. The founders basically interviewed uh, prisoners that got released and kind of and interviews, you know, what they did as far as tactics. So Medusa is I is heavily based on I shock you, I hit you, I hit your eyes, I hit your throat, I hit your groin. After I shock you, I latch. I get an overhook, an underhook, or a collar tie. And now, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, reverse grip or standard grip, now comes the knife, okay? So when I see these, this is stuff I incorporate in my level three that I've been close in there, but they're very relevant because again, these attacks are going on every day, whether it's Piper in South Africa, muggings, robberies, intimidation, the gangs, or again, the penal system, you know, in America. And so why I don't embrace obviously, and I make sure, and I definitely am very careful what, uh, how I explain this to my students and what I'm giving them. I'm, and my explanation is say, look, I want you guys to look at this, this is where this comes from, but I want you to understand this from how dangerous to let somebody potentially get close to you that you don't know and what could go wrong terribly quickly. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's not like, Hey guys, I want you to be these offensive machines. Hardly. It's more from the defensive aspect, extracting that, so they are create good habits. What are good habits? Well, don't let just anybody get close to you that you don't know because all what all could go wrong mm -hmm. in there. So very unique systems, um, heavily, both heavily thrust oriented, no slashes, um, based on getting close to you, engaging you and getting close. So now they can, mm -hmm. you know, just get on top of you. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. And how have, did those, did learning those systems create any significant light bulbs for you in your own Absolutely. stuff? Okay. What, what's an yeah. example of something that you either added or changed that, that is, is dramatic? Uh, okay. So one of the things that Piper does really incredibly well is distractions. So it could be, I'm coming here. I just get mm. your eyes to go up and now I'm coming behind this. It could be a foot stop in there um it could be that so i think their application of distractions is just incredible mm. i mean their empty hand stuff could be stuff like that and now they're on top of you um and they're coming broken out of, you know kind of old school traditional arts you know those are dirty yeah. tricks and we don't do those and yet you know if you had anybody back in your taekwondo days who <laughs> messed around like that they ate people alive i, I think about I, it. I, I mean i used uh, I my instructor my karate instructor's son, Sean, would put his hand behind his back and wiggle his finger. And you'd look and he'd be on you and you, he'd get you with it every See? time. Because think about it. If I can get your eyes to go up or down, depending on where the distraction is, I mean, and you capitalize on that moment of time. Now you're behind the curve of reaction, you know, the reactionary gap. That's the whole thing. Getting you behind your reactionary gap. I distract you. Now on top of you. Now you're playing catch up. But the problem is you're playing catch up with this. Mm -hmm. So it's not punches. It can be punches, but worst case scenario, it's a weapon. Now you're really behind the curve. You know what I mean? And so 
yeah, so the distractions, the broken rhythm is um, in Piper is incredible. It's so I take in distractions, a broken rhythm, and further enhance my FMA far sparring. The movement, so a lot of the movements is I'm aligning my shoulder with hip. Mm -hmm. So for example, let's say if I were to want to escape, like there's a threat in front of me, I escape, I'm going to turn my whole body, right? And then I'm going to go, generally speaking, right? However, if I take my shoulder and hip and I dip there, it propels the direction and it propels as uh, far as the velocity of you able, depending on the direction you're going, so as far as the economy of motion. So we so we align shoulder and hip. So if I'm standing right here and I want to go to my right, instead of turning like this and going, I'm going to shoot off that way like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a unique way of movement, but you're able to get places much more quicker than there. So I found that found fascinating. There's intentional off balancing. So, you know, we're always told, hold your balance, be on balance. I mean, we've all heard it, right? And Piper, they're on the balls of their feet and they're falling into you. And the reason mm -hmm. being is they want to collapse your balance and this coming behind it, which makes it very difficult to recover from because now the person's collapsing into you and then the night and they're able to regain their balance by using what we call two points of contact. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're becoming the second point of contact. I fall into you. If I'm on one leg and I can put my hand on your forehead, I'm going to have balance, two mm -hmm. points of contact. So when I'm falling into you, I'm going to be able, keeping that mind and knowing that now I can regain my balance. It's just stuff so unique that I've just, I'm not saying that these are not in other systems. I'm saying I just have not seen this stuff. Sure. As opposed to to what uh, in Piper. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fascinating system. Fascinating. It, it, Unfortunately, bad name because of the criminal mentality, the gangs. Mm -hmm. But just the stuff that I've chosen to extract from it is just, mm -hmm. um, yeah, been very, very helpful for us. And, was, and my students uh, enjoy it because they're seeing from the lens of the fence. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, hey, the guy's, you know, nothing like going at them or anything like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Are you more, less, or equally fascinated by martial arts now as, let's say, 20 years ago? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, more? you know, like Matt, one, just maturity, able to absorb and and see the value in certain things back then. I didn't have the maturity. Mm. You know, you think you know something back then. And then when you look back at your 20, your 20 year back version of yourself yeah. then, and you're like, it's just, yeah. I mean, maturity to look at things and extract where now I really have that. And I'm very happy with it that I, get, I don't just miss something. I, you know, I look at there, there's got to be a value in there somewhere. I'm sure, you know what I mean? Mm. Definitely more open minded. Uh, and I think it all just falls under just overall maturity, just going through the journey. Um, and, you know, all the people I've met through FMA discussion, all this far, like if I, you know, if I, and nothing against Taekwondo, but if I had stayed in Taekwondo and th not that that would have been terrible, I would have nowhere met the, the phenomenal yeah. people that I have met, you know. You might have met some different phenomenal people, but yeah. I, I, I believe that, you know, we, we the more we, we cross train, the more we experiment, the more likely we are to find something really resonates. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I totally. And the thing is, and I, like I like I share with my students, I give my students like cliches. I mean, just stuff to I hope stick with them. And I'm like, you know, being you know the best version of yourself. Like I need to be the best version of myself as a teacher. So in order, so you could be the best version of myself. Well, to be the best version of myself is that I want to I want to be exposed to as much as humanly possible. So what I can give you. And that, and, uh, and that goes with, and I, I can tell you 20 years ago, I didn't have that frame of mind, <laughs> you know, I, I wish I did, but I didn't, you know, yeah. um, let's talk about your podcast. You know, I love having yeah. other podcasters on the show because, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to work as hard. I can just say, all right, so you're going to show up and <laughs> just, you know, we're going to chat and yeah, uh, but, but I think a big question, cause you've been at it for a bit. You've definitely outlasted yeah. most. Yeah, and that's a good point. 
And so my question, because I know, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, I know how much work this is. Why the heck would you do this? Okay. So, all right. So what happened? We uh, both may need therapy. You know, yeah. Right? Well, yeah, I mentioned that because I'm going to tell you something. There's some funny stories in the beginning of when I, when I was running by these people and they were saying, you're going to run a podcast covering FMA systems, you know, laughing because of the politics and all that. But so are you familiar with Dwight Woods? No. Okay, he's a major JKD. He runs a okay. podcast, uh, JKD, and it does it very incredibly well. Well, Burton, in the summer of 2019, Burton said, hey, look, you should get Dean on. What he's doing with the kids in FMA is fantastic, and he's, uh, he's incorporating a lot of JKD hmm. principles and philosophy. So I went on there, and I was, you know, uh, humbled and honored to, to go on there. I mean, he's got major JKD guys on there. Chris Kent, I mean, Burton's been on there. I mean, just Paul Vunak. I mean, you know, so I'm on there and I was more enthralled by his role than me being interviewed. Mm. I just found it so neat that this guy is talking to people about something that he loves and he wants to perpetuate and he wants to share Coincidentally, nobody was doing this in FMA. Hmm. There was a void. So that fall in October, I got off kicking and running on um, FMA discussion. Now, I had you know, nobody to basically promote this with. I couldn't attach myself to groups. I was basically just, I'm going to do a few. I'm going to interview my instructors first just to get my feet wet mm -hmm. and get better and there, uh, more refined in the craft. And I'm going to form a group where I could put the videos in there and also kind of create a discussion group where people could share content and all that. And, and then the channel, YouTube, putting them on a channel came uh, third, I believe. But anyway, so it started late October 2019. Mm -hmm. And my first goal was anybody could even listen to me. I mean, like, you know, I didn't have like high aspirations or goals. I, my first goal is anybody listen to me. So I got my instructors on who are well known. Burton was one of them. Uh, Bong Abenir uh, and uh, Tom Sotis of Amok. And so they went well. People were like, man, this is great. You're covering FMA. And it just kind of slowly took off. And by, I would say year three, like, you know, really, and I, yeah, but I tell you, I think what really perpetuated the growth was COVID because mm. people are home. And so what happened was all classes got shut down, as you, as you know. So I was only doing once a week. So I'm thinking like, not having much going on. I'm, hey, what do I do? <laughs> what do I do <laughs> twice a week? Yeah. And so during the whole COVID, I did twice a week. So now I'm gaining more popularity. People are seeing it, more exposure. The group is growing. And uh, and so when COVID ended, I'm like, well, I can't. The one of them's here. I don't know if I could just cut back. That, you know, I know that. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the from inception to present mm. day. Um, but I think, you know, I feel the niche. I, I just think there was a there was a missing voice. And I think I filled it. Hence, I think the popularity, I think it was really due to just nobody was covering it. You know? yeah. and, and if I remember correctly, because you've done a bunch of these, I, I, I catch some of them live on Facebook and you've mm -hmm. had a, uh, somebody recurring that we had on the show quite a few years ago. He's a character and a half, if not, you know, a full two characters, Tim Hartman. <laughs> Tim is, yeah. So <laughs> have a, a really wonderful relationship with Tim. He's One, a great guy. Uh, yeah, I can tell you, he... He gives people opportunity to be part of seminars. I mean, I got part of Terry Dow's uh, seminar there via Tim. Yeah. Like Tim suggests. So, I mean, he is incredibly instrumental in that regard. He shares. Giving, He's willing to he share. Does. In he the really sandbox. does. Yep. And I tell you, he does it better than anybody in the FMA community. So, I try to get him on to highlight that in him. And um, we work well. I mean, we're not the same personality. Sure. And, but that's probably why it works well. Yeah. Um, and uh, matter of fact, I was just on a show last night covering for Ty uh, with him. And uh, so I'm like the backup to FMA talk. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but uh, 
yeah so he's yeah he's a gem um definitely yep he's been on um he did a great episodes on how to run an fma school mm-hmm. i thought it was incredible so in other words i interview people like okay so you know like knowable fma teachers practitioners right sure. in conjunction with that though i do what i call theme episodes so the theme episodes is let's say for an example blunt weapon versus edge weapon what is the better of the self-defense weapons mm-hmm. so we'll talk about i'll get two guys that are pre-season been around and they could share some of their opinions give some insight okay and then i love them because you can really get some good conversation out yeah. of that depending on the subject matter one was i just referenced like how to open a successful fma school um there one is uh what do you look for like maybe for a teacher uh one is you know edge weapon you know self-defense i mean you know you can get really creative and dial in into something as long as it's kind of you know within the framework of fma but but they really could be really insightful and educational if you get the right people on there talking about it you know absolutely you know that's been my experience too you know some of the best episodes are episodes where we just we're batting stuff back and forth you know and it's yeah. often our thursday episodes which are you know you call them theme we call them topic but yeah. sometimes it happens organically out of a conversation you know with our our interview episodes right. that we do on monday you know it, you get the right person across from you and you know that you can poke a little bit without offense. And now it's, now it's back and forth. Oh, you have a different perspective on this. Let's, Mm. let's take this, this very innate element of martial arts, which is to Mm. iterate together. Let's go, let's experiment or play or whatever verb you want to use and see how these two ideas work out. You know, you, you could take, you know, a variety of blunt weapons and a variety of edge weapons and play out some scenarios. But yeah. You can also talk it through if you really, if you've got the experience and that way you can talk, not just the literal, but you can talk the, the theoretical. Absolutely. I mean, no, I totally agree with you. I, I, those are some of my best episodes I, yeah. because you can really just dial in and it's, and, and plus you can get a different perspective. I mean, like, you know, one thing, there's been so many benefits from doing this channel. I mean, one, the phenomenal people I've got to meet, number one. Number two, it's given me opportunity. I, there's no way I could deny that. Uh, number three, educational. Like there's people I've had on, I might know the system name, but doesn't mean I know the intricacies or what they specialize. So it's been educational, opportunity, and just meeting again, just absolutely just, you know, wonderful people um, in there. Mm. Uh, the other thing that we know, we know for is, that, you know, we give people opportunities. So they'll come on the show. They might really resonate with a few people. Now those people contact them maybe for lessons. Yeah. So I know for a fact that people have gotten business out of this, you know, whether it be, you know, they've gotten students, a seminar, um, or we promoting their book that j- they just wrote. Mm-hmm. Now people are buying their book, you know, and, and so there's that aspect. The other aspect is that we run charity events. Mm. So people come to us and they'll be like, Hey, cause there's 12,000 in the group. And so they'll be like, and you know, we've gotten a very good reputation by you're not, you're not allowed to attack anybody in the group, no profanity. If you do that, then this is not the group for you, you know, sure. cause I've seen those jungles. And I want an FMA discussion to be completely different, you know? So, um, so anyway, with that good reputation and people understand uh, you know, what we're about, we'll get, Hey, you guys, can we put this together and run a fundraiser for this sick GM in the Philippines? Mm-hmm. So we've done a lot of that. All the money channel goes to charity. Cool. For the daily charity. Yeah. So, you know, we've just done awesome. a lot, a lot of good things. And people recognize that, that we're kind of selfless. You know what I mean? Giving to, giving back to the community, literally. Yeah, this is, this is not the easiest way to make a living. I mean, the vast majority <laughs> of podcasters don't make a living. You don't make a living <laughs> on it. I, I could, I could no. take the most liberal definition, yeah. most creative definition of the word living, and I, I can't even get there no. from here. But it's rewarding. Yeah. Absolutely. And you used a great yeah. word opportunities and, and you yeah. know those opportunities for you, but also the creation of opportunities for others, I think is so incredibly important. Yeah. 
you know, I was raised that when you have the opportunity, you give back when you can yeah. you do. And you've put yourself in a position where you can give back, I've put myself in a position where I can give back. And it, it mm. means the world, you know, I get some of similar messages, you know, this person mm. connected with this person, or, you know, I, I get ones. I, I thought I was the only one that had been through that, or, you know, that episode motivated me to suck mm. it up and go back to class again, you know, stuff like that. It just, Oh, my heart. Yeah, no, no. Like there's two folks that reached out to me and they said, you know, I given up on FMA because of politics, but when I saw you, I saw your show, I saw what you were about bringing the community together. And that two people said, I got back into FMA because of your show. Mm, I love that. I mean, that like beats you know, any better. amount of money, any money that's coming in by whatever, you know, every quarter, you know what I mean? Totally the channel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we, yeah, it's stuff like that. Or folks will reach out to me and like, hey, thank you for having my instructor on, or thank you what you're doing for the community. I think it's great. I mean, those are those are the absolutely most rewarding, you know. Here's 100%. one. I, I don't know if you've had this yet. Have any of your guests passed away? That I've had on? Yes. Yeah two of them and thank god we had the virtual library that people down the road can go and yeah 100 yep. um we've had a sadly i think we're up to five really uh, yeah, yeah and we get emails you know I, I remember one person passed away and it was a great episode it was one of my favorite episodes we had done it was with somebody i knew nothing about mm. and we just clicked and i just loved this man and really had hoped to connect with him and he passed just a couple of years ago, but I think I got three separate emails from students and the gist of uh, his students and the gist of every mm. one of them was whatever I want, I can spend an hour with him. Yeah. And just, I can just <laughs> Oh, I know. Oh, I got it. I got one for you. So Felix Valencia died a couple of years back and he was one of the little Mako backyard guys from Edgar. So, um, so I had him on, and he just, you could tell he lost weight and all that, but I didn't mm -hmm. want to pry. And, um, but subsequent to that interview, I want to say six months or so, he passed away. Mm -hmm. So, of course, his, his uh, episode on the channel and all that, his daughter wrote me. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want to talk about a tear jerk. She's like, thank you for representing my father, bringing attention to him. I'm just like, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's one of my favorite things about what we do mm. is that we are able to, in our unofficial and, you know, uh, at best semi-professional capacity, we're documenting mm. this stuff. We're chronicling these people. No, it's an opportunity yeah. In a way that, you know, what would have happened if uh -huh. there had been more, um, more of this 50 mm. years ago? I'm guessing we wouldn't have as much politicization. There I wouldn't think you're be correct. as much infighting because it would be easier to look at so and so and say, okay, mm -hmm. well, across this 20 year arc, they said this consistently. We yeah. can assume that you saying that on their deathbed, they changed their mind probably didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And, you know, like a lot, a couple of people, are you familiar with Paulo Rubio? He's a big I've funkier, heard that tact name. funkier oh, tactic. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, he has always been incredibly supportive of what I'm doing. And he says, you have to realize, Dean, you're, you're going to become even more significant down the road when a lot of these guys pass away, but yet there's this virtual library to go on and hear them, see them. And that's, he says, that's when things are going to really kick in and all that. And, you know, when I first heard that and then somebody else, kind of piggybacked what he what he said his sentiment and initially when i thought about it i'm like i don't know maybe you, you know what i mean and because you know when you're in it when you're in the heat and you get to test this when you're in the heat of doing this you're not you're not thinking like what's going to resonate down in the future i mean you might you, you know what i mean you're, you're you're so caught up in the present day of getting these episodes out and who's going to be your next guest and coordination and planning like you're not thinking about hey man in 20 years from now you know this i mean this is going to be talked about spoken about like this museum i like you're, right. you're not thinking about it but others outside looking in 
yeah. are seeing it. Yeah, like yeah. anything else, it's hard to see progress when you're in the midst of it. Yeah, you know, take a I just back. see like, okay, play the next one. All right, I got him coming up. Okay, can I fit? <laughs> yes, I, I, you and know, you it, doing four a day? I don't, I can't even talk. <laughs> well, that's just you know, that's not every day. And I I hope you yeah, yeah, that impression, but, but just. You know, because other I got so much to do. I got I gotta yeah. I gotta bunch them together. Otherwise, and and also honestly, I found even when I did one in a day, I was fried after. Right to hold yeah. that space, you know that to to do this is a lot more difficult than I think people realize to do it. No, they, an interview yeah. takes a yeah, lot of work. Make it, yeah, you want to make it pleasant for them. You have to be engaging. You can't just come in there. I mean, you want to yeah, you want them to say good things about the experience. You know what I mean? The, yeah, you have to stay focused. I have to listen to you. If I'm listening to yeah. another podcast, I can tune out. I can get distracted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, agreed. It's definitely more difficult. And then the, there's the pre-planning, mm -hmm. then the actual, and then the subsequent, the downloading and wherever you're putting it. I mean, so there's sometimes between the planning, the flyers, the download, the sending it out to the different groups is exceeds the actual interview sometimes. Oh, for sure. For sure. I yeah, think we're at you know? some, something like six, seven people touch each episode that we do. Yeah. You know, it, you know what I mean? Team. So it's definitely a lot. And I'm a kind of a, you know, I got some people that help in here, but you know, yeah. I do all the downloading myself and all sure, that. Sure. So, you know, a lot of work. You know, if people yeah. want to find the show or other stuff, you know, you've got social, you've got websites, you know, let's make sure we get, get all that to them. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Um, yeah. So it's, the YouTube is basically FMA discussion. That's that's easy enough to find there. FMA discussion. Um, the group on Facebook is also FMA discussion. Keep it easy. <laughs> and the plug like and Facebook, the podcast is <laughs> FMA discussion. So really easy. Uh, no website yet. It's been talked about. Um, I just. It's not that I'm adverse. To doing it i just look at time yeah. and like if it doesn't move the needle forward if you don't need it right like we we went through a phase where we had everything everywhere everything everywhere all at once right yeah. and i went there's like 40 websites there were days yeah. i was spending hours just updating websites yeah can't do this so yeah you go back and you lot. focus like anything kind of like your blade tech system right you pull back yeah, you focus yeah. what matters most yeah yeah and uh right right and the thing is i mean i think yeah i mean you know website could be neat i mean there there is some talk with some other folks how they're seeing what i'm doing they say look you got something really special there what you're doing and you know we want to see how we can you know grow this for you further and all that. And, and that's all neat and fine. But you know, when I first came into this, you know, my ambitions were not monetarily, they were not like popularity. Um, you know, this all just kind of just happened over this close to four year period, you know what I mean? But really my ambitions were, you know, I had three goals besides somebody listening to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I just don't want the big names. I want to get people, you know, that don't have a big name, but they have something to offer. They've never had a platform to be heard before. And I wanted to give them a chance like Dwight gave me. I mean, I was a nobody and I want to pay that back to folks. Number two, I wanted to get female practitioners and instructors. I want them to have also a platform, this male dominated martial art. I wanted the females also to have a, you know, to have opportunity to be heard mm -hmm. and all that. And my third was, I want a, a group where people can come to and not have to worry about being attacked for saying the wrong thing or called names or just divisive and just like that. Mm -hmm. And so knock on wood so far, all three have been kind of been coming along. Mm -hmm. Good to hear. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is probably a good time for us to to start winding down here. I appreciate you coming on. Oh yeah. yeah. Always great to talk to somebody who who's in the trade, so to speak, makes my job yeah. much easier, which thank you for that. But we end with the guest. So what do you want to offer up as your final words to the audience? Yeah. 
you get one journey, it's your journey. Make it special. There's not indentured servitude. Go out and experience as much as you can. Touch hands as much as people as you can. Experience as many different arts as you can. Um, don't be afraid not to take a chance to do something for person, you know, and because maybe you don't feel that you're well known enough or popular enough or your criteria or what you have for certificates or ranks, you know what I mean? You get one journey, you know, make it the best. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Even if you didn't, even if you enjoyed it half as much, I'm sure you got a lot out of it. Dean, thanks for coming on. Thanks for doing what you do. Thanks for your support. Thanks for doing an awesome podcast. Audience, I've said it before, I'm bear saying again, if you find a podcast you enjoy more than martial arts radio, go check that one out. I, I want you to train. Our goal here is to connect, educate, and entertain. Our mission is to get everyone in the world to train for six months. And that requires more and different and better. And I love what Dean's doing. It's awesome stuff. I love what the FMA community is doing. They're killing it. And they deserve some of your support and at the very least some of your interest. So go see what he's doing. If you love what we do and what we're doing, Patreon, Podcast 1-5, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Sign up for the newsletter. We do seminars. You want me to help you grow your school? I do that for a lot of schools. We're doing a great job with that. We have limited space. Sometimes there's a waiting list. Don't be afraid to reach out. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. We're doing everything we can for you. We appreciate your support in whatever way you choose to show it. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.